if you're hitting um, roadblock after roadblock after roadblock, sometimes it's about sticking with it to push through. And sometimes it's about you need to adapt. You need to make some changes and listen to the feedback you're getting. Maybe it's about your price point. Maybe it's about your target audience or maybe it's about your target client base. Are you a solopreneur looking to two times your revenue to fund your lifestyle and give back? Well, this podcast is for you. We bring you inspirational guests sharing actionable tips to solve many of the struggles you face each and every day. And now over to your host, Paul Higgins. Hello to the Build, Live, Give podcast. If you're a first-time listener, welcome. And if you're a regular, thanks for your support. Love to get your feedback at paul at buildlivegive.com. Our guest today is someone who studied architecture for six years. She then worked in an architectural design firm uh, called Glensler. She then went on to be a project architect at IA Interior, and then she realized that this was not for her. And she talks in the podcast about how she actually changed that decision based on her skills. But she pivoted to a ALG group where she was VP of recruiting and then now went into her current career, which is career coaching. So why listen to this? So one is how a career coach can help you to find your purpose. The second is the decision process on how and when it's best to start your own business. And the third thing is advice on how to handle that terrible T intersection where you've tried solopreneurship and you're not quite sure if you're going to make it versus going back and getting a job. So what I'll do now is hand you over to Michelle Rademacher from RP4C. Welcome, Michelle Rademacher, to the Build, Live, Give podcast. So welcome, Michelle. Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me. Yeah, look, great to have you on. But why don't we just kick off with something that your family or friends would know about you that we wouldn't? So it's not business related, but I think it's fun because it's coming out this week. I'm a really big Downton Abbey fan and they have their new movie release that's happening, I think, on the 20th. So I'm looking forward to going to that with my mom, who's another fan. Great. So sorry, you, you're actually going there? Is in physically. Oh man, I wish. Uh. <laughs> I really wish. No, we'll just be going to the theater here in <laughs> Illinois, US. <laughs> I've seen the ads for that uh, trip over the pond, but no. <laughs> Look, there's a, a great documentary on. So in Australia, we've got a broadcaster called SBS, and okay. they've got a great uh, inside view of of the actual the mansion. So who owns it? Oh, it goes through all the rooms. Awesome. Yeah, it's really great. So if I can find it, I'll uh, send you the link. Or if you just search for it, you'll you'll definitely find that it. That would be fabulous. Yes, but, <laughs> I've uh, rewatched it several times, so I will be on <laughs> that. Thank you for that. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, uh, I can think of a lot worse addictions, so I think that one's a uh, very. <laughs> to be British, it's very graceful and, and nice. So yeah. uh, look, I know you had a wonderful career. Started off in you know architecture, and and now you've gone into your current career, which we will talk about more later uh, and career I think is the operative word but just tell me a little bit about you know for you what was the decision to to go and run your own business it really became a calling and I say that because I think entrepreneurship is in the blood uh, it's just as far as I can surmise and also in the coaching of other professionals Paul but it's I say calling because it's not for the faint of heart and I think you really have to be wired to do it so it was a couple of steps to this, including recognizing that I had chosen a career that I was mismatched for and really built up a lot of identity in it, which would be architecture. Yes. And I made a first pivot to executive recruiting to that industry and then really found that calling in the coaching space of other professionals. Great. And what was the sort of take us to the moment where you decided to make that first the big career change from architecture to, to recruiting? That was actually a really long process. I first felt the, that something was amiss um, kind of post-recession, like 2009-10 was when things were not really at all back up and running. But in 2011, it started to stabilize a little bit out here in the Chicagoland region. And it's just something was off. And I felt like I was trying to figure out what I thought that maybe I was just 
not servicing the right kinds of clients and I needed to change project work. Or I thought maybe I needed to change a company culture. And really at the end of the day, I was just in the wrong career. I was in the wrong profession for me. And that was a very difficult thing to let go of because behind a 12 year career in architecture is four years of undergraduate work and two years of master's work in that same industry. So it was a lot to give up. So it wasn't, it wasn't fast for me. It was actually very slow. It was for, I did the math recently because I was kind of curious myself in terms of how long it was about four years and 10 months before I made the actual change. Wow. And if, you know, someone's listening at the moment and they might be, you know, they might be a month in, they might be four years in. I know for me, it was definitely, you know, close to that five year mark. What, what advice on reflection would you give them? I don't think you can rush yourself in the sense that you really do have to be ready for the change to go into um, solopreneurship or entrepreneurship, whichever one you want to call it. Um, But I also would say it's more difficult when you're trying to do it on your own. And I think, I don't know if that's the case for you too, Paul, but that was partly why it took me so long. I didn't actually know of a concept of a career coach and actually wish I had because Mm -hmm. that would have expedited the process because I would have known what was wrong. It's very difficult for you to diagnose on your own because you're the one in the mess of it. So my advice to them would be if you're more serious about it and you think that this is a possibility, come alongside somebody that can help you get there because that's the key to getting there faster. And if you're at the five-year mark or close like you and I had been, I would say go. And if you've really been thinking about it that long, really make the investigation happen. Stop sitting on it. Yeah. And I think the, you know, the fear to me was much greater than the actual. Um, And, you know, I'm not saying year two, the fear didn't come back, but it was a lot less. And and I I totally agree with you that, you know, trying to self-diagnose, I actually went to a career change company that I paid for. Uh, myself Mm. and it was a big investment but the problem was that they were very good at just changing careers you know within the same context you know they normally dealt with corporate people they treated it all as corporate and to be honest I just didn't get it I got some value but not the value I wanted because of of that because I didn't really understand that change Um, oh that's interesting yeah what what's your perspective on that do you have you come across that within the industry Well, I've come across it in the context of um, prospective clients that I've talked to. They may be discussing that, you know, there's a potential um, larger company to go to to kind of do maybe a boot camp, but it's company paid. And there's a concept, I think, behind it. There's nothing wrong with those business types. But I think one of the things that entrepreneurs need is a one-on-one and a specialized tailored methodology. Because when something's programmed like what you experienced, Paul, that's more corporate bent, they're doing it well for maybe switching gears in a corporate setting. But if it's truly for starting your own business, that's different. And I think it does take an, um, a tailored approach. So I would say I haven't gone through what you're talking about. I just did a lot of different things myself in that four year, 10 month period of trying to figure out what was wrong and yes. or what was amiss. And, you know, you can assessment. Um, you can go do assessments to death at some point. And I think the problem is you can't really help yourself. You have to have somebody outside it to look inside. Yeah, look, uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's uh, very wise. And, uh, you know, for you, when you finally made that transition after four years, uh, 10 months, was it easier or harder than you expected? Well, I had a nice um, leaning into the change because I wasn't on my own with the first career change. I worked with a company that specialized in executive recruiting to architecture, design, and construction. But what it was a, why it was helpful for me, Paul, was that it was a stepping stone to moving from the corporate pace of commuting. So I'm in Chicago area, which means um, you know, you're a two-hour commute sometimes, depending on where you live in the suburbs of the city. And going in board and office to working at home and setting up your own structure, working on the phone all the time. That was a shift and that was necessary, I think, to help me be successful right out the gate on my own business because that wasn't something I had to adjust to. I was already doing that. 
if that makes sense. Yeah, look, it does. And and I know you said, you know, you in effect got some help, but who else along the way has helped you uh, build the successful business that you've got today? You know, mentors, coaches, masterminds, you know, who's, who's supporting you? Well, I get a lot of support from my family. Um, I remember when I talked to them about the fact that I was going to do it, they were supportive because they knew the change needed to happen. There was enough going on for me that it was like, this definitely needs to, I need to make that shift. And at the same time, I wish I would have taken more counsel with my dad who ran his own practice for years because um, I could have learned a lot, (laughs) but neither one of us really (laughs) thought about that. It was kind of one of those things that it was more of that, I think a blessing in the failing as you go, like fail forward, as they say. And we were talking, I think maybe it was six, seven months post start of the business. And it was these conversations that I, I joked with my dad, I said, I should have been talking about this in month one, what happened? And I have, I, did, I guess part of it is I exude um, confidence in what I'm doing. And I did do well in certain areas, but there was also major lessons to learn in those first six months that um, they really gave great counsel to. So my family is one. And then I would say that um, the coaching certification programs that I've gone through, there's just a nice network of folks that are, um, I wouldn't say everyone's like-minded because I think they have different specialties, but we do rally around this idea of helping people. And we we're very passionate about that. And so that's another group that I get a lot of support from. Yeah. And uh, your dad, what sort of practice did your dad run? My dad's a doctor of chiropractic, so he ran his own private practice for, I don't even remember, I mean, all my life, and then I think they sold it in the 2000s or something, so it was something I just grew up around him being a small business owner, and he, Paul, he made it look a lot easier than it really was. I just told him, like, so many times this year, I was like, you made this look simple. Oh, my goodness, <laughs> you know, but as a kid, you don't really have to know the hard stuff. You just yes. get to know the fun stuff, but yeah, he made it look easy. Great. And uh, the, the coaching accreditation, was that with you, Map? Yeah, it is. Yeah, so just tell, tell us all a little bit about UMAP. UMAP is really um, just, I feel like it's a really sweet thing in the coaching space and in the personal development space because one of the things that was kind of a happy sad for me, Paul, as I came through the certification process was that I could look back into my first career in architecture and understand very quickly where things were misaligned. Mm -hmm. And to give you a quick synopsis of that, UMAP looks at the four pillars of career satisfaction, your strengths, which are your natural God-given talents, your values, your skills, which are the daily tasks that you do, the ones that motivate you and energize you, and then your career interest type, which is somewhat dealing with personality. And um, for me, in my rear view of my first career in architecture, the misalignment was in the daily tasks, the skills section. And I had no idea that the majority of what I did as a project architect, 60% of those tasks were things that just drained my energy. And it was like a nice recognition. And I wasn't, I, I'm at that point, Paul, of doing this, um, I think five years post leaving architecture, right? But it also was like, oh my goodness, I can't believe for 12 years, I stuck in something that at the end of every day and every week was zapping me of my energy. Mm. That's how challenging that one can be because it can sneak up on you. And that's the, I think, as I've coached clients through the UMAP process, everyone has a different pillar that kind of brings a different um, breakthrough moment. And I will say the most tends to happen for my clients through values and skills. Yes, and have you ever heard of Savile Wave? No, Silver Wave? No. Uh, well, uh, I've heard Savile of Savile Wave. Sorry, it's a um, it's a, it's a once again a a, a career, um, uh, profiling tool, and and I did it like you. I, I I didn't do it five years post. I actually did it about three months after I made the decision to leave corporate, and yeah, okay. it was it was black and white that not just corporate, but particularly the company I was in, it just mm-hmm. was similar to you, very energy draining and, and nothing, you know, it's a brilliant company, you know, Coca-Cola and the system was fantastic. But at that time, it just wasn't the best place for me. And, uh, you know, I think that that diagnostic tool, I think is fantastic, plus with the one-on-one coaching to, to bring that out. But before we go in, oh, actually, what we'll do is go into the next section, which is the build section. So 
you know, I think you've sort of hinted on this, but if someone comes up to you and says, Hey, Michelle, what do you do for a living? You know, how could you help me? How do you best describe that? Well, if I say that I'm a career coach, some people I think understand that more now, whereas I think five to even 10 years ago, people were like, okay, well, what's that? So I do think that you go beyond the title. And if I was to answer somebody outside of a title, I would say, what I do is I help people understand the purpose for which they've been created and help them to find the way to live that out, and especially in relation to their careers. And that's the specialization, Paul, to what I do. For me, it's all about purpose-driven careers, and I really believe that. I believe everybody has been made for a purpose, and a lot of people, I think, are not walking in it because we can get stuck in a career. You have a lot of years behind you. It's really sometimes daunting to make a change, but I think a lot of your listeners, as you know, we've, we've chatted, are at that precipice and probably need to be making a change. Yeah, and, and um, without, you know, Uh, giving someone's name can you give us an example of what that means in reality you know someone you've worked with that have followed their purpose uh, you know and changed their career yeah there's um there's a lot so I'll pick maybe a few and give the highlights um some people think of career change as big leaps and bounds and I'll give an example of that so they understand it so um a client I've had I won't reveal any names but um It's someone who's been in corporate finance and they really were just at that crossroads, had had a challenge with the culture of the company. And so they just had to hit a pause and we got working together so that they could figure out what the, the biggest thing that every client goes through, Paul, that I coach is getting clear about what they do well. And that's one of the reasons why I like UMAP so much is because it focuses on the positive in you. Mm. And in that discovery process, self-discovery, we learned that this individual was wired and really called to teaching or education and especially in leadership. And so it's been really cool to see these steps be made. And there was such an ownership by the individual about making the change. And that's a pretty big leaps and bounds one inclusive of we were looking at the changes in compensation that are associated with that. And here's the difference. Anybody that's walking in their purpose and living it out, the money factor doesn't really play in because you actually are so satisfied in what you're doing. Everything else just works out. So that's a big leaps and bounds one. And then a smaller dial and shift of career change, which I think more people have done than they realize would be an example of a client who, um, trying to like run through the Rolodex. One that's really fun in terms of wanting clarification that they were in the right lane. We did that self-discovery process and they were, but they wanted to improve upon a certain aspect of the role that they had and they weren't getting a chance to do it. So then it became an adjustment in their career to go to a place where they would be actually able to walk that out better. And I'm having to cloak a lot of the details because it's um, I'm working with the individual still and we're right at that change where there's interviews happening and all that good stuff. But that would be something where they were already in the right role. But what we found within this was the company and the culture. And so now they're making that adjustment. And that's still a career change because you're making a shift. Yeah. And, and look, you know, you mentioned it before that, you know, solopreneurship or entrepreneurship is not for everyone and it is very difficult. And I, I can't, can't remember how many times I thought I've just got to go back. You know, I can't continue uh, to do this, but for me, my health dictated that that wasn't a good option for me. So I was really had, I, I burnt the boat in a way and that was due mm-hmm. to my health. But, you know, I'm sure, sh- sure you've come across people that are in that position so they're running their own business it's not quite working and they're debating whether they should keep the path or whether they should go back from a path once traveled what's your uh, perspective and advice on that I think you need to keep sound counsel and I think you need to keep it with those that really understand your values so the reason you map I circle back to it a lot I circle back to it even in my own business about myself because any kinds of decisions I make as a business have to align to my values. Um, and I had a moment, I wouldn't say I abandoned ship, but I really thought maybe I should go inboard a little bit as I also build the business. You know, maybe that was a misfire that I, you know, didn't get right. 
And I had that council of family and the people that really could speak into my situation, knowing who I am and not advising me based on their own set of values. Mm -hmm. And I will say the other part that would be my advice is you can't ignore the gut instinct. It was very hard at the beginning of actually first quarter 2019 because I was like, oh man, I I really got to shift gears. And by doing that, it has been a win. But that would be something that I think if you're hitting um, roadblock after roadblock after roadblock, sometimes it's about sticking with it to push through. And sometimes it's about you need to adapt. You need to make some changes and listen to the feedback you're getting. Maybe it's about your price point. Maybe it's about your target audience or maybe it's about your target client base. But, uh, you know, I don't think it's worth abandoning ship if you haven't done some adjustments to first see if by testing those that that would make the breakthrough happen. Yeah, and I think that sort of relates back to your point before about, you know, it's very hard to self-coach. And I think if you, oh man, you know, get a yeah. coach, get a mentor, get that perspective. So I think family's great, like you mentioned, and alignment to your values, but also get that perspective. Like I'll often mentor people and, you know, what seems dead obvious to me and to them, once you say it, was dead obvious to them as well, but they don't see it in the, you know, in all the stress and the uh, confusion that they're going through. And um, yes, yeah, I know because so your mind's on everything. Your mind's on the income. I mean, when you're when you're starting a business and you really are small and you haven't hired a lot, you're thinking of the sales, the marketing, the cash influx. You know who needs to be paid. There's just so much your mind has to go towards that you really can't be. Um, on the outside looking in, you're right in the midst of it. <laughs> Correct. And it's something that you've never done before. Like, you know, as you said, you, you know, invested 18 years in a particular career with uni and, uh, and doing it. And yeah. then all of a sudden you're in, you know, you're starting from scratch on, on something completely new. So yeah, get mm-hmm. help from those that uh, have gone before you. I think um, it's obvious. And, and for you at the moment, you know, what, What's the number one challenge you're facing to continue to grow your business, which is effectively helping people with um, you know, making the right career choices? I'm in a really good growth mode right now. So my biggest challenge actually is how to manage that growth with still being the solo practitioner and how to scale appropriately because that has been a goal of mine. Um, so that's my, it's my straight up challenge, um, how to manage tasks. And I do like to speak to work-life balance with clients. And right now I'm not really living that, but that's okay because I'm building the business and I'm building for the sustainability of it. But that's my challenge right now. How do I adjust my own work tasks? What do I hire for so that I can be more available for coaching or for, um, some specific, really exciting things that are on the near horizon for the exponential growth. Mm, and and look, it's um, you know a lot of people say you know that's great, but I know it's still a problem to have. So you know, not having enough leads is you know in some cases uh, easier to solve than some of the challenges that you have there, and um, very common. And um, you know, are ones that once again, you know, getting help certainly you know sees that a lot. I'll seize the benefits of that come a lot quicker. And as far as leads, so, you know, like you said, you've, you've done a brilliant job in uh, getting a lot of business in. What's been the most successful source of leads for you? Well, that was really fun for me. Um, So one of the consultants I work with um, is in, well, I shouldn't say your neck of the woods because it's (laughs) across the country for you, but it's on your side of the world. And um, this goes back to the way that I make decisions as a business owner. And I would say for those that are looking at solopreneurship, having an understanding of themselves through their own UMAP would be key because knowing how you make decisions through your strengths, which we do use StrengthsFinder, but the application of those strengths, Paul, is really important. Mm -hmm. And so to circle back to that, one of my my fuel strength is deliberative, which means it's the energy source that just pushes everything forward. And someone who is deliberative means that they are very conscientious of every single decision. Others who are more, you know, I guess they might see it as slow, like that's a misperception of the strength, but I'm really careful about my decisions. And in such, I was, I had tons of people asking about, oh, I can do this for you, that for you through the leads process. And it took somebody that did it so well that 
it got me to pay attention. And I'm really keen on, I can read through a lot of junk. I can read through the spin. I can read through the hook. And instead, I just really wanted to engage with this professional. And I was I was really surprised at how well um, he did it and how well his business does it. And um, I, I believed in what he's doing. So that's that was really key. And we developed the process together. Um, he's brilliant at what he does. I actually got some coaching from him in terms of, you know, how to um, work through the sales process. Because I would say if you and I had this podcast um, three, four months ago, I would have said my biggest thing that I'm working on is the consistency and leads, but mm. that's not a problem anymore. Right. Brilliant. And just before we go into the live section, I'd like to tell you about a high level group mentoring program called BLG Surge. So we work with like-minded solopreneurs to add additional revenue streams. So very similar to what we've been talking about with Michelle so far, to fund your lifestyle and to work less hours. So just go to buildlivegive.com forward slash surge to apply and join the waitlist today. And there'll also be a link to that in the in the show notes. But I think, you know, as you said, Michelle, you know, getting that help in an area that you know, is not your strength and also be surrounded by experts or peers with experiences is so valuable. So the next section is the live section. So why don't you tell us about some of the daily habits that make you successful? Well, Paul, this is going to sound like it's a plug and people who don't know me don't understand that I don't do anything that's not authentic. (laughs) So I'm not in engagement pods on LinkedIn. It's just not my MO. So, but what I'm going to say is I've really enjoyed your podcast because I've learned a lot of things about the um, fine tuning of the business. My strength in being adaptable can have its weakness in being too adaptable, too um, prone to following distractions. So as silly as it sounds, I put up on my monitor for my computer, ignore the distractions, follow to the to-do list. Because for me, it's so easy to switch gears. I really love multitasking. And it's a benefit in some ways and it's a detriment in others. So I've found that that's really key to making sure that I stay on task. And I use like a lot of the tips that you've shared, which you talk to a lot of business owners. I mean, I really can't emphasize this enough for people that are at the outset of their own business growth to pay attention to a podcast like yours or others. You know what I mean? Yeah, it looked totally. And, uh, you know, I practice what I preach. I'm an avid listener of podcasts and, you know, I don't think there's too many unique ideas in the world. There's always a, a spin on an idea, but, you know, listening and, you know, I just can't think of in the old days, you know, you'd have to go out and buy these books for, you know, $25, 30 yes. You know, you'd never finish one, <laughs> all those things. <laughs> you'd fall asleep. Or blah, you're blah, not blah. a book reader. Yeah. yeah, correct. Whereas now, you know, you know, even I work from home like you, but, you know, hang out the washing, you know, walk the dog, whatever. I can listen to podcasts at two and a half times speed and, you know, get brilliant, not just content, but ideas. So look, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm biased, obviously, because I love podcasting, but I think it's a great way. So if you're listening now, you know, like Michelle said, uh, there's lots of out there. And if anyone wants to get my list of uh, podcasts, just email me at uh, paul at buildlivegive.com and uh, I'll I'll give you my hidden list as well. So the next section is the give section. So what's a charity or a community that you support and why? Um, I'm going to answer that, but I want to go back to something really quick on the live section, Paul, for yeah, the sure. sake of, I think the, the LinkedIn is one of my favorite communities to, to coordinate and collaborate in and everything. I just, it's my favorite social media platform, but there's, there can be a lot of noise for people in terms of what to follow. And so I think when you can stay to true to who you are and make sure that what you're listening to aligns to your values, that is important. Cause there's just so much like you could have somebody else out there that contradicts your own advice. And it's like, well, who do I listen to? Right. So yes. I think that's good. When you come into the give section, I, um, there isn't like one big macro charity that I would recommend. I actually think what's more impactful is when people become engaged in their local community. Um, when we are actually intentional about helping those that we can see in our own community, real change can happen. Um, as a part of my local church, we have, um, a part of that, which is called share the hope. And so we literally, um, collect food and pack it in boxes 
and it's available for anybody in the community that is on, you know, hard times. And you'd be surprised, Paul. It's not just the people that are in a homeless shelter or, um, you know, holding the sign on the street corner. There's hard times for families that are maybe in between jobs, you know, and yes. coaching people that are unemployed. You know, sometimes they just could really use a help with, hey, I've got some groceries that didn't cost me anything. So that's something that I think if we can look to the local, there's real impact that can happen. Excellent. Well, the last section is the action section where I'll ask you a question and get a rapid fire response. So the first one is, what are your three top personal effectiveness tips? <laughs> I'm laughing because I don't think I have top three. I really find that I'm um, spontaneous by nature. And so I do have a to-do list item at the end of every day at 9.30 p.m. Central Time, which says plan your to-do list for the next day. That's the main thing that I do <laughs> to stay effective. So just one tip. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, it's, uh, great. And the next one is what tech could you not live without or not run your business without? Um, I'm a Mac girl. So the computer, the iPhone, the watch, everything gets coordinated. I, I really, I don't know how I would do business without it all. And Zoom. Zoom is really helpful. <laughs> yeah, well, look, they're mine. And uh, just as a quick aside, I think my wife, she thought that the only reason I left corporate is so I could buy everything Mac. Um, <laughs> Linda, if you're listening now, it was never the case. Uh, oh, and funny. The next one is, you know, what's your best source of new ideas to improve you and your business? So this is funny, Paul, because you and I um, had a quick exchange on one of your um, posts about ideation like new ideas are not hard for you. That's something that I don't ever have to struggle with. So I don't have a good advice for others, except that I think if you can start to aggregate data from folks that you follow with content leaders on LinkedIn, or maybe through business books that you enjoy, but sometimes just creating a new story. But for me, I'm, I don't know if it's fortunate or not, because sometimes you can't even stop the ideas. They just keep flowing. <laughs> it's, I mean, I think you could relate. That's the yeah, challenge, re- honestly. Definitely, yeah, definitely. And, and as in most strengths, a strength overplay can sometimes be a weakness. And my team, every team I've ever managed, have always come back and said, look, you know, I love working for you, but uh, gee, you come up with lots of ideas. <laughs> yeah, like slow down, right? <laughs> yeah, correct, which is code for, come on, we can't keep up. Uh, so the last question is, is uh, a really big question, and that's why we leave it to the last, but what impact do you want to leave on the world? I really um, am hoping that I am known less for who I am and more known for um, helping others really understand the beauty that um, they've been created to do. So I, I hope that I am seen as a servant leader, someone that is not pointing to self. And I find that a challenge, I will just say, with LinkedIn because you're out there and it seems as if it's just like me, me, me. But in reality, I really, I tell my clients all the time, it's about you. This is about Mm. getting you to where you're supposed to be. Brilliant. Well, look, uh, you can find out more about Michelle. And, uh, you know, in particular, if you loved what she talked about in the UMAP, you could uh, reach out to her to uh, go through that at rp the number four c.com and we'll have all of the great links and everything that michelle's mentioned in the show notes and also we'll put in there her link to her linkedin profile as well so you can reach out to her on uh, linkedin but um, michelle it's been wonderful uh, as i said uh, before we went live to air that i feel like i know you because we've communicated really well on linkedin but it was great yeah. to actually hear more of your story today and you know, and your passion for helping others, which has come through really clear. Oh, thank you so much, Paul. It's been a pleasure. And I love hearing your Australian accent. I wonder <laughs> if you get that a lot. It's fun. <laughs> to those of us in the States, we sound boring to those <laughs> yeah, in look, Australia. It, yeah, it's, it's funny. Um, yeah. No, I, like any person, I don't like hearing my own accent, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't realize how thick it is until I actually you know, listen back to a podcast. I'm like, wow, because most of the of people I interview are from uh, America. So, yeah. but uh, That's no, so fun. Yeah. Thank it's been you. a treat, Paul. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, same. Have a, have a great night. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. I really enjoyed that interview with Michelle. It was absolutely fantastic. So you can get all the links and everything mentioned in the show notes at buildlivegive.com. And if you believe someone would get a benefit from listening to this, like you have, please share it 
with them. And also, Michelle would love to get your feedback and the appreciation on LinkedIn. So the profile will be in the show notes to connect with her. If you would like to apply for our group mentoring, go to buildlivegive.com forward slash surge. Also, the links will be in the show notes. So please take action to build new revenue streams, to fund your lifestyle, and to give back. Thank you for listening to the Build, Live, Give podcast. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. It would mean the world to us.